Good evening. Uh, welcome everyone uh, to this first in a series of Newcastle University hosted at Newcastle Debates. My name is Chris Day. I'm Vice Chancellor and President of Newcastle University and you'll meet the other panellists in a moment. The idea behind this series of debates is to um, enable you to engage with key figures uh, responsible for shaping the future of our wonderful region as we emerge from this Covid crisis. Uh, topics of future debates will include things like uh, economic recovery from the crisis, uh, climate change and how we as partners are collaborating together to tackle that. Um, but today uh, we're going to focus on how we can improve and tackle the health inequalities across the northeast in this post pandemic world. So I will hand over to Jane Robinson, who will be chairing the debates before coming back to you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this event. And please uh, do accept our apologies for the slightly late start, which was due to some technical errors. So um, uh, hopefully we'll be able to um, get through quite a lot of um, discussions in, as Chris has said, our first Newcastle debate event. Um, and we'll be discussing how we can make uh, a healthier uh, future post pandemic. If you are tweeting about uh, the event tonight and you want to share your thoughts, please do use the hashtag Newcastle Debates. We've already received some really interesting questions from the audience, but if you'd like to join the debate live, please do use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and we'll read it out and get through as many as we possibly can. You'll also see um, that throughout the debate, we're going to be um, uh, posting some opinion polls on the screen. So let us have your, your thoughts. For our first poll, we've asked people where they are, um, they are watching from. And um, I can say that we've got 38% of people from um, Newcastle upon Tyne, um, uh, followed up by 23% uh, from uh, Northumberland. We've got 7% of people who are from outside of the Northeast. So that's interesting. I think we've got over 200 um, people who've uh, registered for this evening's event. I'd like to briefly introduce our panel, if I may, um, very grateful um, to colleagues who've agreed to participate in this first event. Um, first of all, uh, Professor Chris Day, who is the Vice Chancellor and President of Newcastle University. Chris is an internationally recognised liver specialist and a fellow and former clinical vice president of the Academy of Medical Science. He chairs the N8 group of Northern Research Intensive University and the board of the National Office for Strategic Coordination of Health Research. Dame Jackie Daniel is Chief Executive of Newcastle upon Tyne Hospital Trust. Dame Jackie has been a Chief Executive Officer for the last 16 years and has led Acute Medical Mental Health and Specialist Trust. She plays a pivotal role in Collaborative Newcastle, a new partnership which brings together some of the biggest organisations in Newcastle with the aim of improving the health, wealth and well-being of everyone in the city. Pat Ritchie is Chief Executive of Newcastle City Council. Pat joined the council in January 2013, having had a number of regional and national roles. She has been at the forefront of the region's response to the coronavirus pandemic and is influencing national policy through the Local Economic Recovery Group led by the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government. And finally, Carol Botton, who is Chief Executive of uh, BON, Voluntary Organisations Network Northeast. BON represent over a thousand members charities, voluntary organisations and community groups from across the region. Carol has over 20 years working in this sector and is also a member of the Northeast Local Enterprise Partnership Board. So to our panel, uh, our opening question is, do you believe there is a north-south divide in healthcare? Jackie, can I start with you? You can indeed. Well, a very short answer to that, um, Jane, is absolutely there is a north-south um, divide in terms of health. I, I guess I feel like I've you know, been in the NHS for nearly 40 years and um, there's always been a north-south divide. I think the interesting question is whether that's getting any better. And obviously we've had a recent update to the Marmot report, didn't we, um, in the last 12 months, I think. Um, and actually what that tells us is that rather than getting better in actual fact, we, 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 we're sliding backwards. Um, 
And I think in that report, um, it talked about, you know, the decline in life expectancy in the most deprived areas in the UK. And, and we know many of those are in the Northeast. So there's been quite a lot of reports. Uh, the other one I point to, which is very relevant in terms of kind of the current pandemic, is the one that was published by the Northern Health Science Alliance recently, of which Newcastle University, you know, is a part, a part of. Um, and that showed the inequalities in terms of mortality rates throughout the pandemic, you know, um, showing that actually proportionately more people were actually not just um, suffering at the hands of this awful pandemic, but also dying prematurely um, too. And it's, for me, it's, it's a deep irony that, you know, we've got some of the best healthcare organisations in, in the region, in the UK, three rated outstanding, including the one that I lead, which is Newcastle Hospitals. But it's, you know, a deep, it didn't give me any sense of relief to know that although that's great for our patients, actually, until we start to turn the dial of those deeper health inequalities, um, we really, we're not going to change the fortunes of future generations. I feel very, very strongly that there's a, a deep connection between, as you say, Jane, health, wealth and well-being. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop there, but there definitely is. Yeah, I mean, there's a quick chat that's come in around the difference between investment in health and the divide there and the health outcomes. And I think, as you say, Jackie, we're, we have some fantastic um, uh, health provision uh, in, in, in this part, part of the world. But can I, can I turn perhaps, um, uh, Pat, to you in terms of this question around whether um, poverty is one of the main reasons why um, so many people in the Northeast um, do suffer poor health? Uh, yes, thanks. Thanks very much, Jane. Um, I, I mean, I suppose I would kind of echo what Jackie said that, um, you know, the determinants of health are, are much broader than um, access to health care, that, um, you know, there's poor housing, um, education, air quality, access to green space, nutrition, all of those things impact on, uh, on, on your health and ongoing uh, living a healthy life. And, and I suppose what, what we see across, um, across the, 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 the North East and in Newcastle in particular is the kind of impact that um, uh, deprivation and inequality has on health. And that links back to poverty. So, as Jackie talked about, um, you know, one of the the, the, the ways in which um, you can impact on health is getting somebody education and and a good job, and having access to good housing gets better outcomes. And if you don't really tackle those broader social and economic impacts on health, then the population isn't necessarily going to get healthier because the system treats those that are ill rather than, um, you know, sort of looking at the causes. And you can see that across the city. So if you live in Biker um, at age 55, you get to about 64 and that's when you, you, help, you hit disability and you hit ill health. It takes to 74 from when you're 55, if you live in Pontylan. So you have 10 healthier years in, in one part of the city compared with another. And that's the sort of issue that we really, really need to tackle. But that does need to be done in a way that um, tackles the root causes, which links back to, to poverty, as, uh, as you talked about. And in Collaborative Newcastle, what we're really trying to to do is to um, look not just at how we get better at joining up health um, systems, but look at how we get better at jointly tackling some of the early issues and some of the prevention. So for example, we're focusing um, on young people and particularly on children and families and how we can do wraparound services that give young people the best start in life. And that's a way of tackling those inequalities that lead to poorer health outcomes for some compared with others in our city. Yeah, I, I think that that's um, a, a really interesting point. Chris, did you want to come in on the back of that? Yeah, just I, I agree completely that that the deprivation and poverty in the region contributes to contributes to its its poor health outcomes. But I would just point out that the the reverse is also true, which I think leads to this 
vicious circle. So, of course, perhaps less talked about. If you have a, a less healthy population, they're less productive. They have more days off work. They don't contribute to the economy. So if we can break this circle with improved health care, um, which you've heard is so good in the region, we may be able to get more people to work and improve the economy that way. So they're very much interlinked. It's not just a straight line between one and the other. So those wider determinants, I thought Pat as well about the, the differences within the region in terms of, of health outcomes is also really interesting. Carol, did you want to say a word about this kind of, you know, that, that kind of wider um, determinants and, and the kind of impact of poverty? Yeah, I mean, I think just leading on from what Pat and Jackie have said, I think um, for, for me in the sector, there's been lots of conversations in recent months about how the COVID pandemic has really shone a light on the existing inequalities and exacerbated those inequalities. Um, we've seen that, as Jackie said, it's, it's impacted on our poorest communities much more than, than our more affluent ones. And, and we truly believe that um, we need to use this opportunity of this greater awareness of those inequalities to build back better. You know, that's a, a phrase that started out in the voluntary sector and seems to have been adopted right across the board. And, you know, there's been a lot of great work through the pandemic as well in terms of partnerships and building relationships between organisations, between the sector and statutory partners and all of those sorts of things. And I think there's ripe opportunity for a real systems change and a real changing the approach that we all take to address those, those deep rooted inequalities that we've all touched upon. I think now is the time to do it. We've got a window of opportunity. And if we don't, we'll be sat here in 30 years time, a different group of people on a different uh, event, having the same conversations over and over again, because we've been trying for 30 years and we haven't managed it. So the time is now, is what I'm saying. I think that's a really point. And coming, coming up on, uh, on some of the questions of the extent to which we need to change national policy and how much we can actually do for ourselves in the region. Just wondered perhaps, Pat, whether you might uh, like to reflect on, on, on that. Well, I, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer in we can do a lot in the region through um, joint working and, and strong leadership. And I think that's been demonstrated in, uh, in the work we've done in Collaborative Newcastle. You know, we, we've started from a place-based point of view and we've built up a strong reputation for doing things innovatively and for um, you know, ensuring that we, we take the resource and the people and the culture that we have and we build something within the city that's, that's sort of within our own control and works to the different um, national frameworks as they emerge. Um, having said that, I think there are a, there are a number of um, uh, areas of national policy that will impact on our ability to go further in the city. And I'd particularly highlight um, uh, social care and the need for a clear um, a funding settlement around social care and ensuring that it's treated as kind of part of that, that broader system, because at the minute, social care is largely funded through increases to council tax. And that isn't sustainable, especially if you go back to North-South divide, we have a, a weaker council tax. We have people in the lower bands of council tax not paying as much into the system. And that becomes a kind of vicious circle in terms of funding. Um, and we have less people who fund themselves. So there's a greater demand on the social care system. And you end up with a kind of unfairness built into the way that the system is funded. And we have to, as a country, find a sustainable solution to that and I think that the pandemic has really thrown that into um, sharp relief and the other thing I would really highlight is the future of public health and public health England and, and how far that is based on a, a place-based local model that is driven by um, uh, you know, places really being able to target resources at prevention, at communities and at working with people around health and resilience rather than a, a sort of system that 
um, you know, almost kind of deals with the problem when it's become um, a particular issue. And I think that prevention and ensuring that the public health system continues to focus on things like housing and things like air quality will be really important in thinking about the, the future of public health England. I'd add to that um, the ability for places like ours to be able to develop their own locally led um, response to the pandemic. When things have worked best, they've worked um, when we've been able to work together as voluntary sector, health, local government, academic partners to just do things in a way that is quick, um, non-siloed, but we've kind of been able to do that for our place. And I'd like the national system to free us up the flexibility to continue to do that. Jackie, I think uh, you wanted to come in on this point as well. I, ju I just want to add to it really, um, because, you know, this has been quite a year, you know, this has been quite a year in my nearly 40 years. There's been no rule book, you know, it's, especially in the early part of this pandemic, I was coming into the hospitals trying to lead 16, 17,000 staff and, and really, you know, we were having to, to get on with it. Actually, both within the organisation, but externally, as Pat's described, we, we worked our way through it really quickly um, with some fantastic local solutions, which we won't want to go back and unpick now. Some of the work that we've done together with teams in the city, early days support that we gave the care homes, it was a game changer. And, you know, I think absolutely, um, help save lives, help prevent admissions, help just, you know, keep people in a more resilient place. So it is, it is critical. We've learned a big lesson through this, this year and we must take, as Carol said, take the positives of that and really work, I think, with us, the strength of our partnerships and, and I think with the profile we've deservedly got um, with national policymakers, make sure they stick to that brief that local um, determination is by far, um, uh, will we'll get us much, much further. Yeah. So thinking about the kind of the, the long, longer term, the, the, what the quest, one question that we had was about that, the, a lot of the focus has been on the immediate management of the, the health crisis, but thinking about the longer term impact, and um, how we're going to deal with that. And, and Pat, you referenced um, uh, children and, and young, young people and, and the impact that, um, uh, that we've seen around, uh, around children and young people. Just, just wondering if we could reflect on what, what, what we need to be thinking about now in terms of the, the longer term um, impacts. Um, I don't know, um, Pat, do you want to sort of kick off, yeah? I can do, Jane, thank you. I, I, I do think that um, young people who've gone through this last year and will still go through it this year, um, you know, have been um, an, impacted on um, by the kind of just sheer disruption that they've had to deal with um, around education and support. And if we think about how important early years are to what happens to you in the future, you know, a significant proportion of our young people have kind of missed out on that socialisation, the kind of um, way in which you kind of interact with, with your peers and the, the kind of teaching that, that being part of a class as you go into school really kind of teaches you and prepares you for future life. And we've got to find ways of um, building that back for young people. And not just early years, those that have been at different key stages, you know, young people going into GCSEs and A-levels being completely disrupted. And, you know, whilst I, I really, really do take my hat off to the way that teachers have stood up to deal with, uh, you know, that disruption through IT support, through bubbles, through, you know, um, kind of currently going through lateral flow testing before they start teaching. They've been absolutely remarkable. 
but we really do need to work with schools, with government and within the city to look at how we ensure that those young people um, don't lose out in the future because it, it goes back to that, the thing we talked about earlier about, um, you know, that can affect your life chances right through if we don't recover some of the education that those young people have lost and, uh, you know, there is evidence that that, that 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 um, is impacting more on those young people who are disadvantaged, who don't have access to IT, who maybe don't have kind of quite the same degree of support. Um, and we do need to ensure that we tackle that as a, as a city and we make sure that, you know, I, I can see a potential increased demand for children's social care, for example, as we come through this, this crisis. But what we have to do is make it clear to those young people that there is hope for the future. And as a city, we will work with them and respond to and help them, you know, kind of recover, whether that's through uh, tutorial support, support with IT, summer clubs, extra, you know, extra provision to support them. Um, you know, we need to work out how we're going to do that with the government and, and others. And the last thing I would say about young people is that they are disproportionately affected by some of the jobs that are likely to go in the economy once furlough and other things are removed. You, you know, you're going to see jobs likely to be lost in, already lost now, in hospitality, in retail, and in areas which are often starter jobs for young people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've got to really work with the government programmes like Kickstart, and other training provision to try and ensure that young people are able to access those bits of the economy that are actually doing relatively well, even though we're going through the challenges of the pandemic. So digital, social care, jobs in testing and in public health. And, you know, Jackie and, and, and the partners have created a significant number of jobs in the Lighthouse Lab. And that makes, we've got to offer those um, employment and training opportunities to young people so that we don't end up with generational unemployment, which we've seen, you know, not that long ago within the city. Yeah. And I, I think, Chris, turning to you, I mean, the, the in the city, we have over 50,000 students across the two universities. There's been a big impact on those students. But as Pat says, also that the, the jobs that, that those students hopefully would go into will be impacted. Do you want to comment on, on, on the university's role in that regard? Yeah, I guess there's two aspects of it, isn't it? One is it looks as if during the COVID crisis, students are much more likely to choose their home university. Um, so for us, a lot of the effort we put in over the last few years to what's called in our sector widening participation will become increasingly important. So we're up to nearly 20% of our intake now is, 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 is children from disadvantaged backgrounds. And I can only see that increasing if there is this more reliance on on going to your local university. Of course, the, the acute problem for us at the moment is we've got, I guess, roughly six or 7,000 students hopefully going to graduate this summer and enter the job market. Around half of our students you know, end up in the job market in the Northeast, which we're delighted about because we import them from, from outside. But of course, many of those um, students are studying programs um, that require face-to-face -face practical in studios so there has been some exemptions from the government for us to continue face-to-face -face teaching um, for things like medicine and dentistry and school teaching which you would expect and we are we are able to train those face-to-face -face with collaboration with uh, the, the hospital trust obviously our medical students are still doing placements and will we will produce those three or four hundred doctors in the summer I think I'm more concerned about the architects and uh, the chemists and the engineers who are at the moment frozen out of any laboratory experience, any sort of practical hands-on, trying to be an architect without access to students. And I think there is a real risk across the country. It's obviously not a Newcastle specific problem that there will be a, a bunch of students who might not graduate this summer with the knock-on effects of those. So that's what the acute problem is for us. And then as you said, Jane, if they do graduate, we, able, we are able to give them the practical experience they need over the next three or four months to get them that degree. What kind of job market are they going into? So we're putting in more effort than we've ever done before to the career guidance and working with the partners, some of them who are on this call, to try and find the placements for them. As, as Pat says, this whole lost generation, whether it's 
you know, school kids progressing through their stages, whether it's graduates coming out right at the other end and, and finding no, no place to work. I think we've got a real responsibility to look after this generation right from, you know, early years through to, through to graduates. Carol, you, your perspective, I mean, the um, uh, community and voluntary sector plays such an important role in, uh, in, in working with, with children and young people, particularly from more disadvantaged backgrounds. What are your reflections on, on, on how we can better understand and mitigate those, those increased inequalities? I think, as other people have said, um, the impact we can see the immediate impact and we can anticipate what's going to come down the line in terms of jobs and all of those sorts of things. But I also think there's a great deal that we don't know at this point. Um, I know that, you know, we, I, I do it myself. We talk about how resilient children are and they are resilient. And I've been, you know, astounded by how resilient my daughter has been to the whole, um, the whole pandemic and the impact it's had on her life. But I just think there's so much we don't know in terms of the longer term impacts on children and young people, their mental health, their resilience long term. And I think we just need to be mindful that we, we there is a great deal of un unknown and uncertainty in all of this, but there are things that we can do now so that we are ready to respond to those needs as they emerge. And I suppose, like Pat said, um, investing in early years, investing in, community support for families and children and young people. Um, I think over the last few years, it would be, it would be um, right to say that youth services have been decimated right across um, the country because of government funding constraints. And now is the time to build those back because it is that wraparound support that children need inside school and outside of school as well to ensure that whatever needs and whatever demands um, they have as we emerge from this pandemic, that those are being met because we, we don't know, we do not know the, the entirety of the picture, but we need to be ready to respond and the resources need to be there so that organisations are ready to respond. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the, the role of um, um, organisations like the North East um, uh, Commission on Child Poverty, I think, can help in terms of and our understanding in that regard. Can we move some of the other questions to the other end of the age spectrum? And, and a number of questions from our audiences are focused on older people, and in particular, the, the long term impact on, on, on older people, many of whom have perhaps been shielding or have been in their homes um, for some of them well, o well over a year. Um, what sort of impact is, are, are we seeing there and, 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 and how, how might we mitigate, mitigate some of those challenges? You ask me, sorry, Jane. Well, maybe uh, I'm, I'm quite happy to come in with just just a bit of a an anecdote. So obviously, um, lots of elderly people have been going for their vaccinations in in recent weeks, which is fabulous. But what we're hearing back from volunteers that are supporting um, the immunisations is that um, there, there are old people presenting who have not been out. For the best part of a year and they certainly haven't spoken to anybody who is a professional in terms of the health professional or, or social care or whatever and they're presenting all sorts of needs that have emerged you know that they're, they're having a chat with them in the 15 minutes after having their injection and all sorts of things are coming to light so i do think there is going to be a tsunami of need coming out from older older people as we are as they do re-engage with society again i mean stuff around mental health around isolation and just basic mobility we you know we know how important it is for old people to get to get out and about for all sorts of reasons physical health as well as mental health so i do think there are going to be some really severe impact and again we need to be ready to respond to that as they emerge okay yeah, just building on those points that Carol made, I mean, I, I was just struck just in the last part of the conversation. We've, we've got a huge legacy. Um, I think, first of all, just to pick up on Carol's point about, I keep hearing phrases like, well, when we get through the pandemic. I, I don't think we can think about this as getting through anything. I think the last year when I remember sitting here this time last year thinking, 
oh, this is just a little bit of a flurry. I mean, seriously, you know, we knew nothing about what the next few months were going to unfold. There's so much, as Carol has said, that we still don't know. So I don't think it's easy to predict. What I do know, sitting in the position I sit in, is that, you know, I think the mental health impact, that is, that is very real. Um, it's very real for my staff who've just been through what they've been through, a really traumatic um, uh, year. And let's just, just be, just for a moment, just put a reality check on where we are. As, as I sit here tonight, we've got 83 patients being ventilated in critical care. So we're a long way out of this pandemic. And I'm looking at a backlog of care, going back to Carol's point about the elderly citizens. A lot of those people haven't been accessing care, even you know when they should, should have been. Um, and so I think we're gonna see quite a big impact, which will take probably, well, it will certainly take years to get back into a more normal, stabilized position. And it's a kind of combination between unmet um, real need and health professionals, including G GPs, who are just absolutely, um, have been flat out and are just frankly tired and will just take, it'll take some time for them to, to really spring back, I think. Yeah, I think that, that sense that um, uh, it's premature to talk about post-pandemic. I, I think the other thing that um, we hear a lot about is um, back to normal. And I think there is a view um, from many people and there's some uh, comments in the chat as well about actually we should think about not going back to normal. We should think about actually that that wasn't where we wanted to be. We need to be thinking about a different future. And I don't know, Chris, can I bring you in just to say a, a word about sort of thinking about the future and, and we have in Newcastle the National Innovation Centre for Ageing. What sort of role could that play in terms of reimagining a different kind of future? Yeah, good good point. I mean, so the, the fact that we have the National Innovation Centre for Ageing is a reflection of well, probably three or four decades of, of world leading research on uh, illnesses associated with ageing and the ageing population. So we are quite well placed and in partnership with uh, the Hospital Trust and the City Council, we've, we've recently um, uh, purchased the, the old Newcastle General Hospital site and, and we plan to develop that into a campus for ageing and vitality where we will bring um, researchers, developers, innovators, looking at everything from you know, new treatments and new prevention strategies for classical illnesses in the more sort of medical end, right through to you know, creating um, new housing with with uh, novel technology centres somewhere in the middle. And, and and I mention that because we see that as a real growth area for the city, which will attract you know global companies. The point what Nick A does, the National Innovation Centre for Aging, it has a it has a bunch of experts. It has a really close link with Voice North, which is our panel of over 8,000 um, individuals from, from the Northeast, healthy uh, and some patients, and bringing companies in who have ideas of new products or, or technologies that might be able to help uh, individuals as they get older, and working with our academics on the one side to help them develop those new products, and working with the population, the people on this call and others in the, the Voice North group to advise them on do you actually want one of these gadgets or widgets or bits of technology? Is this what you what you need? So working with the users, working with the academics, and trying to create uh, the benefit that will that will occur in our local test bed um, for the people in the region. But of course, the attraction for that is not only do they get first dibs on any new inventions or new treatments or new technologies, but that we want this to be a magnet for companies um, across the country, but across the world to come to this part of the world because they want to work in this area and create those jobs and boost the economy. So I think we can turn our long-term academic experts in ageing to a real benefit for the people of the Northeast, both from their health side, but also from the economic side. So that link between health and wealth, I think, coming through very strongly. Pat, did you want to come in on this point as well? Yeah, I did. Thanks, Jean. Uh, a couple of things just to say about the kind of earlier conversation about, um, you know, going back to normal. I, I don't think we will go back to normal in a, in a whole range of different ways. And, you know, I think the city has to change and respond to that. And I'll, I'll say a bit about that in a minute. But if you think about what we what we have done through the the pandemic around you know 
a much greater relationship with care homes, much more kind of wraparound support with care homes. And we recognised early that that's where you know, some of the big risks were. If you think about what we've done with the voluntary sector on shielding and on supporting people who were shielding, we stood up what we call the Toon Army within a couple of weeks where you know volunteers came forward to support people who were isolated or who were you know not able to get out to get support or, or who were just lonely. And we you know we've kind of built a, a whole sort of support package around all of that. And we've also um, set up City Lifeline where, you know, a whole range of um, businesses, Phoenix gave the first donation, uh, Ruben Brothers have given food and, and support. And so the kind of city, um, the voluntary sector of business and the statutory partners have all come together to, to try and provide the support. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, people haven't been affected by this because they absolutely have. But what we've learned through that kind of redesign and different ways of delivering support, taking into account the human needs as much as anything into, you know, how do, how do people support each other? I think there's, there's a lot to build on for the future around how we think about um, communities and support for people and, and kind of working in a different way um, to, 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 to sort of blur the boundaries to support people. I think there's a lot to build on there. And Chris talked about, um, you know, some of the work that, that the um, Nick A are doing around, um, you know, a city that is good to live in as you grow older. They're helping us think about the kind of future of the city. And I would, I would kind of broaden that to talk about the way in which the city needs to become a, a good place to live for everybody, more inclusive, access to open space, access to, um, you know, to kind of um, walkable, cycling, good connections between different bits of the city and um, housing that adapts to your needs and that reflects the different sort of stage of life that you're at and a kind of mixed housing over in the city. That has to be the kind of way in which we think about recovery because the, the kind of retail footprint, the kind of way that the city is, is going to change and develop. And I, I, I do think people will continue to work in the centre of Newcastle in offices. I think they just might do things in a, in a kind of more mixed way, do some of this, do some at home, but for some bits around innovation or around the need to kind of have uh, development conversations with staff, you'll do that in places. But those, those kind of office type places will also look different. And they'll, they'll, they'll adapt to different needs. And there's some of the, the, the office um, space that we have on the Lumen, on, on the Helix site, is already adapting to be that. You know, Homes England have taken a number of floors there. They're looking at a mixed model of working in sort of the city centre, but also at home, maybe working in other parts of the country. And we need to kind of develop a city that responds to that. And for me, that's a fair city where it's good to, to grow old, but it's also good to be young. And, mm. and that has to be kind of part of our vision for the for the future, because they're kind of part of the same side of the same coin, I think. Mm. It's, it's interesting, Pat, that you talk about that kind of blended approach. And one of the questions that's come up in the QA relates to the extent to which uh, the panel think that we'll, we'll hold on to virtual delivery of, of services going forward. Um, I, mean, I don't know, Jackie, from a, from a health perspective, do you think that, that we're going to see a, a lot of things done virtually in, in the future? I think so. I mean, I, I think... We it always will need to be a blended and nuanced approach, particularly when we're thinking about, you know, the elderly. But we, we you know, on, on a sixpence really turned around our outpatient consultations, you know, and now the vast majority of those are done without anybody having to get in a car, make a journey, pollute the environment, you know, um, and take hours from their job or, you know, out of their life. So, and the clinicians uh, and patients are reporting really, really positively about that one change alone. But, you know, we're using a lot of new technology for, you know, in different areas, to, to, again, to do remote consultations. So for sure that, that is, and people are now well used to it, interestingly, quickly adapted. Um, so we won't go back, uh, we won't return to the old way of working. Carol, did you want to come in on that point? 
Yeah, uh, I did. I mean, I think there are great advantages to um, delivering ser services digitally. And like Jackie has said, it doesn't work for all people, but um, I, this is something that I've been banging on about and I will complete, continue to bang on about in terms of recovery um, and the need to address the digital divide and digital poverty and digital exclusion. The North East, unfortunately, has the highest rates in the UK. 53% of our population are digitally excluded in some way. And so we need to be really, really mindful of that. And part of the problem with digital inclusion or exclusion is it, it touches and impacts across all sorts of different um, parts of people's lives through health, uh, gaining employment, accessing public services more broadly, education now, all of these things. And therefore, quite a lot, I see quite a lot of agencies thinking that somebody else is dealing with it. But actually, there's no joined up approach to this. And actually, if we want to build back as a region that has better education um, attainment, that has better job outcomes for people, that has better health outcomes for people, we need to address digital exclusion in a way that's joined up, that's coordinated under a regional strategy, because it's one thing that is holding us back massively as a region, that unless we do something about it in a really strategic, coordinated way, it will not be resolved. It's a really difficult issue because it's very complex. It's different um, issues with different types of communities. It's all about access to data as well as kit. And then you've got the skills and the confidence side of things. And it absolutely needs to be addressed as part of our recovery plans. It's certainly one of those things that comes up in so many of the conversations, the educational attainment, health and, and, and so on. So um, definitely. I think is, is, is a kind of a really important theme and um, uh, just wanted to check with the panel I know we started a little bit late the questions are coming thick and fast if if the panel are agreeable um we'd, we'd like to try and run this till uh 6 40 just sort of have that extra 10 minutes is can I just check that that's okay for the panel members that's brilliant really appreciate that because I think people have got lots of questions they'd like like to ask um can we maybe um, uh, sort of change tack a little bit then going back to the questions and, and this has been something that um, a number of the panel have already referenced but this issue around um, mental health and, and COVID-19 clearly has impacted on so many people um, of all ages in, in terms of, uh, of mental health and we've, we've got a, a poll that um, is, uh, is coming up now so we'll see what the audience think about this but can I, um, perhaps um, starting, Jackie, you mentioned this, COVID-19 will have a lasting impact on many people's mental health and well-being. How are we going to, to meet those needs? Goodness knows, that's, that's a really big question. Um, I mean, first of all, to say that uh, I think mental health services were lagging behind in terms of investment and, um, you know, um, the focus that was needed on those services for many, many years. Of course, COVID's hit. We've seen the profound consequences for different age groups in different ways um, of the mental health impact. At the moment, it feels like a tsunami. Um, so, you know, I'll be, I'd be looking for um, a, a whole strategy over a number of years of investment, um, whether it be in, you know, the, the voluntary sector, in, in new technologies to support, um, psychological therapies and all the, I mean, we've got a massive influx, it seems to me, of kind of well-being expertise and advice, but it's, it's kind of serious stuff. So it's, you know, this does need to be deeply thought through. Um, and I don't think we're anywhere near that stage. I'm not hearing any of that coming through from health policy at the moment. I'm sure it will because everybody's recognising it, um, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to need a whole system's multifaceted approach because it's so prevalent and taking on so many forms as has been described really in the conversation so far. Yeah, I mean, just kind of some quick feedback from our from our um, audience. 51% um, of people feel that their mental health has been ne ne negatively impacted by the pandemic. Um, so, uh, so that's uh, uh, the majority of our uh, of our audience. Um, to be honest, I'm surprised it wasn't wasn't higher. We obviously have a 
you know, a, a positive uh, group of group of people. But Carol, do you want to come in on this? Yeah, I think uh, it's just about um, joining this to something that Pat was saying before about the response to the pandemic and huge um, influx of volunteers and people wanting to help. And I think Jackie's right in saying that this is a tsunami of need that's coming coming towards us and how on earth are we going to address it? And I think trying to combine those two things together in terms of how can we encourage people to support their neighbours, their friends, their communities, not with severe mental health issues, but around that well-being and resilience, supporting people to to get them into nature, supporting people to take physical exercise because we, you know, the research tells us that has such a positive impact on mental health. And I think it's just, again, one of the positives that will come out of, of pandemic is the partnership working, um, but also just a bit more open thinking. You know, people have, have you know, really thought quite broadly about how, how are we going to address these issues and how are we going to address them together? And I think that's what's going to be needed to meet the mental health challenge. How can we utilise goodwill of people to support each other? How can we use the mutual aid groups that have sprung up and, and repurpose them to address this issue rather than the food parcels and the shielding and the isolation issue. So I think there's great opportunity. And I think if we work together, we can we can address this. Um, but yeah, it will take that real collaboration and, and a long term strategy, like Jackie has said, it will not be resolved overnight. Yeah, I think that point about it being about the whole system and, and Pat, you were talking earlier about the importance of being a city with green open spaces that is vibrant, where people um, are able to get good quality jobs. Your reflections on, on how we think about um, mental health going forward? I think I would just echo really what was um Jackie and um, and Cal have said that this isn't a sort of straightforward quick fix. There's something about, I suppose, um, us all working it through together in some ways. I mean, I think we've all been affected in different ways by, you know, what, what's happened over the last year and what will continue to happen. And there's some for me about being honest about that and, and kind of being prepared to talk about the impact that it's had on, on us and on others. And that, that's part of the, the kind of way in which you start to, I suppose, have a conversation in the city about how we, how we own that and help with that. And I, do, I do worry about particularly children and families. And I think there's, you know, all, all aspects of it are really worrying, but there is something about young people and what we can do to build on their resilience and really kind of help them sort of be part of that, that solution. I think there's, there's some work to be done. Um, to be sort of thought through around around that, um, and I, I just think I also think that there will be a kind of a, and I don't know when we'll be able to do this in the way that that we've always done as a city, but we're quite good at coming together for events or for for cultural things or for different, and so, somehow that has to be kind of part of the the kind of resilience of the city in the future. You know, it'd be great to get the Great North Run back in some shape or form. It'd be great to have kind of, it, it, they might look different and we might do them different, but things that are about bringing people back together in the city, because I think there'll be a quite a, an appetite from people to kind of want to do that. And and I think we do need to think, we've been thinking in the council groups, you know, whether with some of the investment we've had from, um, North of the time, can we can we have a sort of series of events which are about the city's back and coming back and bringing people together? You, you know, you see that actually in the way that that people want to be outside and walking. They partly want to see other people. You know, we've got a lot of people in the quayside and kind of and it's partly a sort of connection to others that that we're missing. And I think we do need to think about that. And think about how how we can do some of that as a city, you know, particularly with the universities and with with other partners. You know, there's we we were the first to do a virtual concert, not a virtual concert, a socially distanced concert, you know, at the race course, and they were really in demand. And we just have to think innovatively about how we, as kind of people in the city, support one another and come together. 
Yeah, I think that de desire for human beings to have that context and find ways to innovate to be able to do that, because as Jackie says, it's probably, you know, we've still got a journey to go on to be able to, to get to that place. But um, but that opportunity of, of coming coming together and, 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 and I think the point you made also, Pat, about the, the openness and the sense that people, I think now, um, more than ever really, recognise mental health in in the same terms as physical health in terms of its impact and, and, and so on, even if um, uh, uh, clearly it doesn't uh, uh, have the same levels of, of funding. But can I maybe just bring us back to another, uh, some other questions that we've had around, um, um, around the kind of potential backlog of care um, in the sense that a lot of the resources have been um, focused um, for completely understandable reasons in dealing with the impact of the pa pandemic. But the question around the, the, the backlog and how that's going to be met, whether that's about mental health or, 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 or physical health. Jackie, can I come to you first to just uh, reflect on how, we, uh, how you see that? Yeah, I think there's probably a continuing theme in terms of how we think about the, the, the backlog. Um, because if we, just, if we just tackle it in the way that we would have done pre-COVID, I think, well, I think we'll be doing our patients a massive disservice, actually. What's starting to emerge is, is, is the new thinking through collaboration about what's possible, doing it together. So there's a really good example going on right now, um, actually here in Newcastle, where we're building a, um, a cataract um, facility. Um, for our ophthalmology patients. A lot of those are the older people who've been either shielding, who were quite vulnerable, who really obviously for obvious reasons need, need those conditions treated. But that, we, you know, we're doing that on behalf of the whole region. So that will, what that will give us is double the capacity that we would normally have to treat patients with things like cataracts. So, you know, we'll be able to um, provide really good services, but quickly, deal with that, with that um, waiting time issue. And there are other examples of that in other services where clinicians who haven't been at, you know, um, at the, at the, in the front fire, if you like, in terms of critical care, have been working on these issues um, over the last few months. But I think the solutions will look more dynamic, much more collaborative. Um, and so I don't think it's just a straight run through of, well, we've just got to find more resources to put more waiting lists and more theatre lists. And I think the solutions will, will be much more imaginative and actually much better for patients in the long term. However, um, it'd be remiss of me not to say that it's going to take a, a while um, before we're back into a more stable position because for some conditions, patients, the, the waiting lists are, you know, are real and are very long at the moment. Chris, to you that the kind of the, 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 the medical research and wider research that the university is, is doing, I, I guess, is also playing a role. Well, yeah, it would be fair to say it's been much easier um, to keep the, the research in the medical school going than obviously the teaching because it's quite straightforward to organise um, our lab research in a socially distanced way. We've had, um, you know, full... Uh, capacity labs working pretty much flat out throughout the whole of this and I think one of the things that's come one of the things that's come good out of the uh, of this crisis of course has been a general appreciation of the value of medical research by the population who perhaps were wondering what research was for in some aspects and you know the huge effort that's gone into into finding you know the vaccine for COVID has demonstrated what researchers can do if they focus their minds and for, for us while we've had some um, were, you know, some of our researchers have, have been able to turn their research to looking at COVID. For the vast majority, they've continued to work on the diseases they've always worked on. But I think what we're going to see even more in the Northeast um, is a willingness of people to take part in research. And, you know, Jackie's trust there comes top of the table every single year for number of patients in, in clinical trials at any one time. And I think what we're seeing across the country is people coming forward in their droves, whether it be for vaccine trials, but for medical research trials. So I think one positive long-term effect that will come out of this is a, you know, as I say, is a real appreciation of what medical research working with in partnership between 
hospitals and medical schools can achieve. And many of the great research we do in arthritis and diabetes and liver disease and many of those other areas, I think they will see positive knock-on effects. I'd be interested in Carol's comment about, you know, one of the things, of course, we have seen in medical research during this crisis is, um, is a fall off in the uh, in the amount of money that's been raised by medical charities. And that's been a real concern that we, I've been part of a lobbying group trying to persuade the government to, to backfill some of that. But the feeling I think in the sector is that there will be a big bounce back once, you know, once people are more confident um, about their jobs or about their economic status, that they will see, we will see this big increase in, in donations to medical charities. But places like CRUK, British Heart Foundation, are really struggling at the minute. But as I say, I, I think we're, we're hopeful that that will pick up and all the great medical research you've seen over the last 12 months um, uh, will come back to the fore again in those areas that are reliant on charity funding. That brings us back to some of the points Pat was making, those big big events like the Great North Run that raise millions for yeah. um, for those kind of charities. And exactly. On, uh, the, the, the voluntary sector more widely. Um, um, we're sort of coming towards the last, last five, five minutes and, and um, the, the kind of, I think, consistent theme of what we've heard um, tonight is around collaboration and how we come together um, with uh, different uh, uh, colleagues working together uh, to benefit local communities. And one of the questions um, that, that we've been asked is how can five we... Minutes. Together, the diverse public bodies and institutions in the northeast to agree and affect the necessary change. And I, I think we've talked talked a lot about that um, tonight. Um, but um, I think really for 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 all for all all all, all the panel members, um, uh, maybe um, uh, Carol, can we can we start with you? Yeah, I mean, I think we've already been doing this as we've we've talked about through the through the pandemic at a local level sub-regional and regional level, bringing people together um, to, to bring about more innovative solutions. And I suppose what I want to see is for that not to be forgotten, but to continue and to build upon that, the foundations of the last few months and, to, and for, for a greater recognition. And I think this has happened of, of the role of the voluntary sector in supporting people and communities and, and enabling the sector to have a, an equal voice and an equal place at those tables and to work with the sector um, as part of those, those innovative solutions. Because the, the thing about so many community organisations, you know, the vast majority of the sector in the Northeast are really small organisations that work in neighbourhoods and they understand those people and those communities. They understand what will work and what won't work. And they've got a real, that insight that they can bring to the table, as well as their, their reach, um, their ability to, to galvanise and react quickly, all of those things. So, yeah, I'm really hopeful that we can in the future work together more collaboratively across the, the private sector, the, the public sector and the voluntary sector and really come up with those solutions that we need for all the challenges that we've discussed uh, this evening and some of those that we haven't, like climate change, for example. And I think, you know, there's a real willingness. That's yeah, there's a willingness that, that for, for, for real collaborations and real meaningful partnerships that I hope can continue. Thank you. Chris? No, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I think we were pretty good um, as a region. You know, most of us on this call, you know, know how our, how our uh, colleagues in, in other regions work together. I think we've always believed that we, we got it better here in, in the work between the academic sector and the health sector and, the, and local government and, and the charity sector. I think what the last year has shown is that we can ramp this up even further. And again, thinking about the positives, I think some of the work we've done together, whether it be around health, whether it be about climate change, which we'll hear about in another debate, I think we've shown what we can do with collaboration. And I don't think there's any looking back for our organisations, to be honest. I think we'll, we'll move forward addressing all these big questions of society together where we can achieve so much more than if we pursue our own little furrows. Thank you. J Jackie. So just to echo really what I want to say, I think we've been seen, if I can use the term, we've been seen from space, people have been watching, you know, the eyes have been on cities like ours during times like this and, and, and it's been noticeable about, you know, the, the degree of collaboration. 
I think we can amplify it. I think we can, we can, because, and there's a strength in relationships, genuine, I believe, kind of trust and um, such ambition that I don't hear in other parts of the country, um, that we, it's all to play for. Um, and, you know, we'll continue to do that. Our people, our people need us to be doing it and we will continue to do that as Chris has said. Thanks, Jackie. And I, I think the, it, the, the other point that's been made in the Q&A is that, that this is a long, long, long term commitment. The, these, these changes will take time as well as collaboration. Um, Pat, finally to you. Um, thanks, Jean. I, I mean, I, I think, um, I, you know, all of what people have said about um, the collaboration that's happened is, is really important and we'll continue to develop recovery plans, both around people and the economy at a city, um, at a north of time level and at the regional level. And, you know, the degree of collaboration, for example, between the seven local authorities that has come around, uh, you know, as a result of, of COVID and the confidence that that's built in the leaders working jointly together, I think is really important for the future. But I suppose the thing I, I would sort of say in closing is that you know, the thing that has been most striking about this from a council point of view has been the importance of the public health team and their need, to, you know, I, I've never been more grateful to the fact that you've got a public health team embedded in the council that can work with business, that's worked with the universities, that's worked with around, um, you know, some of the social, the, the care homes work. And, and, you know, I think particularly that kind of remembering the importance of public health and how it pervades, I think, a lot of, you know, different aspects of society within the city, but remembering the importance of public health and the economy. So health in the economy, are, are, are the kind of fundamental things that this crisis has brought into sharp focus. And we really, really shouldn't like, lose that. And that, it's been a theme right through of some of the things that, you know, Chris talked about a healthy workforce and Jackie talked about the kind of wider inequalities and how that, that impacts on the economy. And, and, and Carol talked about, you know, communities and, 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 and kind of inequalities and fairness. And to me, that whole thing about public health being all of our business. We're all experts in it now, you know, in a whole range of ways. And I think we just need to kind of keep that going forward because the kind of values that come with that will be really important to the recovery in the city um, for the future. Thank you. And that's a, a really positive note to end, end on. And I, and I think that, you know, the themes that have come across this evening about um, inclusivity around collaboration, but critically that link between really um, our health, our wealth and our well-being and all of how these things link together, I think has come across very powerfully. Um, I'm so sorry, we, we're going to have to um, clo close it there. I'm so grateful to our panel members for staying on and our audience for staying on for a, for a few few more, more minutes. Um, Thank you very much to our panel, uh, Professor Chris Day, Dan Jackie Daniel, uh, Pat Ritchie um, and Carol Bottom. And also um, thank you to uh, the audience um, uh, for your, your questions. We've done our best to get through as many as we can. Um, uh, we do hope that you will join us for our next event. Um, uh, Pat's uh, lined that up very nicely because we'll be focusing on the economy. So um, the other side of the coin but very much linked um, I think and details of that will be announced shortly so if you'd like to receive information about those upcoming events um, you can sub subscribe to our emailing list as well so we've really uh, welcome feedback this is the first event of its kind um, that we've uh, that we've done so please do uh, if you can take the opportunity to complete the short questionnaire at the end of the debate um, Thank you once again to our panel and to the audience. Have a lovely evening and uh, hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.